In this video, I'd like to go through the hormonal regulation of labor, the stages of labor, and the hormonal regulation of um, breastfeeding and milk production. So in the notes, uh, you can see uh, we establish the pregnancy, and once we establish the pregnancy by talking about gastrulation, formation of the embryonic membranes, formation and function of the placenta. We skip a lot of time here, so we're jumping straight to childbirth, and that's what we do um, for this class, and so you don't have to worry about any type of week by week or, um, you know, uh, trimester, uh, what's going on as far as development goes. But to say a few words about that, even though it's not officially in the class, basically, uh, during the uh, first trimester, what's going to happen is fertilization occurs, and it takes about one week to go down the uh, fallopian tube, and about one week for implantation. And so you can see we're calling the uh, conceptus, uh, the, the product of conception, the conceptus. Okay, or you could also say pre-embryo. And we know that after implantation occurs, once the inner cell mass organizes itself into an embryonic disc and then eventually the three-layered embryo, that's the difference here. So once gastrulation occurs and we have the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm, that's when we're going to use this term embryo. And from here, embryonic development will proceed and it's going to lay down the groundwork for all of the organ systems. Okay, all of the organ systems that we talked about in, in AP1 and the ones that we're going to continue to talk about in AP2. And once all of the organ systems are um, in place, you know, just like a very rudimentary, uh, like precursor material, that's the point in time when the offspring would be considered a fetus. So embryonic development goes from week three to uh, week eight. And then week nine, the offspring is considered a fetus, and the offspring will be considered a fetus right through the rest of gestation. And so um, what we did in our class, just to switch to another picture, kind of where we left off, I would say, you know, we were about here where we had talked about uh, formation of the embryo. Now I'm telling you that... Um, you know, about week nine, we'll call the conceptus uh, a fetus. The umbilical cord will form. As I said, blood vessels will form in the umbilical cord, and those blood vessels branch out and fill the chorionic villi. The chorionic villi are digging into the decidua basalis, and together, the chorionic villi and the decidua basalis, that is the placenta, and that's where all exchange is going to take place between the offspring and the mother. We can see the yolk sac still penetrating the amnion. We know how that grew from the hypoblast on the ventral surface and then got impinged into that small area by the amnion. So we can see the amnion in place and we can see that the offspring is growing. And I, I guess I would say that would be um, the third trimester, basically what happened. So in the first trimester, uh, you establish all of the, you know, the three primary germ layers and then establish uh, all of the foundations for all of the organ systems. Second trimester, you'll get more growth of the uh, organ systems. I, by growth, I mean like development, I guess I should say. Development and differentiation of the actual parts of the organ systems. That's established usually by like week 24. So for the third trimester, what you're looking at is growth. You're looking at growth of all of those organ systems to um, week 40. And you can see that, because we're going to look at this in a few minutes, that the cervix plays a really important role and that it's like a muscular um, area that's going to keep the uterus uh, closed and keep the um, the developing offspring um, in a in a safe in environment. But now that we're fast forwarding to labor, we're going to disrupt all of this. So um, labor is hormonally regulated. So I'm going to jump back to the notes. And so as far as the initiation of um, labor to Kind of give you the, the uh, cliff notes of this. You know, oxytocin is a hormone that's secreted by the posterior pituitary, and it has to be secreted by the mother. Once the mother starts secreting oxytocin from the posterior pituitary, the mother is in true labor. Uh, we can also induce labor by giving synthetic oxytocin, and that's called pitocin. 
So uh, we can induce labor in that way, or mother's posterior pituitary has to release oxytocin. That's the bottom line for this process. But looking at contributing factors, what's going to lead up to that? Uh, estrogen levels uh, continue to go up throughout gestation. I'm going to pull that graph up in a minute. But we looked at this um, graph a little bit I, earlier in uh, the first video for... Um, for week three, if you wanted to look back at it, but this is the one, uh, let's see, that I'm referring to. So we, we were looking at how HCG is going to really uh, increase initially, and that's going to save the life of the corpus luteum, which is producing the progesterone. But once the placenta forms around week 12, uh, the placenta secretes estrogen and progesterone. And estrogen levels, you can see, really continue to rise throughout gestation. And what estrogen will do is it's going to... Um, stimulate oxytocin receptors to form in the myometrium. So in other words, the myometrium, as gestation continues, is going to become more and more sensitive to this hormone oxytocin. Now, progesterone keeps the endometrium very quiet and happy. You know, that's what it does in a non-pregnant state too, right? So when progesterone levels are high, the endometrium is vascular, glandular. But remember, it also kills off LH, and as soon as we progesterone levels go down, that's when the endometrium goes down too. So here, because the placenta is secreting progesterone, it keeps you know the endometrium very happy. But late in gestation, progesterone levels more or less they can even decline. I know it doesn't show that here, but they can decline or they'll more or less like become steady. And this decrease, relative decrease in progesterone levels that's felt at the end of pregnancy, will make the endometrium more unhappy, so to speak. And so hormonally what's happening is oxytocin receptors are forming in the myometrium, progesterone levels are kind of tapering off, and that's making the um, endometrium more um, more irritable, let's say. And then um, additionally, so I have that they're going to decline or at least taper off, you know, that it contributes to irritability. But the fetus can secrete hormones. Uh, the fetus can secrete oxytocin. And when the fetus secretes oxytocin, that's going to make the uterus contract too. Uh, but that's not true labor. We would consider that false labor. I, I didn't write this down, but cortisol levels in the fetus will increase late in gestation. And that's going to cause, um, uh, like, irritate the mother's um, uterus, which could cause a contraction. But all of these, you know, kind of random contractions can increase the physical stress and the emotion, emotional stress on the mother. Uh, but once the mother's posterior pituitary starts secreting oxytocin due to, you know, the stressful situation, that is the onset of uh, true labor. So with oxytocin, though, it's a positive uh, feedback loop that occurs. So let's take a look at that. So with oxytocin, uh, what is going to happen is there's increased pressure on the so oxytocin causes the uterus to contract, and towards the end of gestation, uh, offspring's head is going to press down on the cervix. That increases pressure on the cervix. So you can see that pressure is the, is the stimulus for oxytocin release. So this pressure is sensed, you know, within mother's brain, and um, that's going to stimulate posterior pituitary to release oxytocin. Oxytocin is a strong, smooth muscle contractant. It's going to cause the uterus to contract, which is, like they're showing us in this picture, going to increase pressure on the cervix, and that increased pressure on the cervix is going to cause oxytocin to be released. When oxytocin is released, it causes the uterus to contract, it's going to increase pressure on the cervix, and that increased pressure causes oxytocin to be released. And so that's the positive feedback loop that um, occurs that would end with delivery of the offspring. So once there's no more increased pressure on the cervix, then there would be no more stimulus for oxytocin release. And so once the mother's brain starts secreting oxytocin, oxytocin, you can see how this positive feedback loop would cause the contractions to become stronger and stronger and closer together. So that is true labor, um, oxytocin. And unfortunately, I took this video off of our playlist. You'll see that um, that video is not uh, out there anymore, so sorry about that. And I did spend quite a bit of time looking at a, for a video that would be, you know, something that would suit us, but everything that I found I thought was unsuitable for us because it was 
you know, talking about positive and negative feedback or, you know, just didn't cover exactly this. So this is what we need to know for oxytocin. And just to go back to um, our notes, the stimulus for release is mechanical stimulation. Okay, that's the pressure on the cervix. Also, pressure on the nipple will cause oxytocin release. And oxytocin is released uh, when nursing um, uh, uh, an infant. So target tissue is smooth muscle in the breast, and we're talking about the uterus right now. It's going it's a strong smooth muscle contractant, and it's a positive feedback mechanism. So that is what will bring about labor. And there are three stages of labor. Uh, the first stage is dilation, and that is uh, the longest stage of labor, particularly for a person that has never um, given birth before. And it begins with um, oxytocin release from the mother, and uh, it will last until the cervix is dilated 10 centimeters. And so the two key processes that occur during dilation is dilation of the cervical opening, cervical opening becomes wider, and effacement, which means that I have that the cervical canal goes away. I'll show you what I'm talking about, that the external and internal os merge. So this is very typically when the amnion will rupture and the amniotic fluid is lost, but it can actually happen um, prior to labor. Actually, if the amnion ruptures, that will initiate labor. The person will uh, definitely go into labor unless uh, they're put in a medical situation and given uh, drugs to prevent that from happening. Maybe they're not in a stage of gestation where we want the um, labor to occur. Okay, so if the amnion rupture is prior to this point, that will induce labor, uh, or it's possible that the amnion won't rupture at all. So it is possible for a person to be born with the amnion intact. And so this one is a little bit, you know, more questionable, but most times it happens during dilation. So I'm going to jump over to some pictures to show you what I'm talking about with um, dilation and uh, effacement. So with dilation, let's take a look at uh, this picture that we were just looking at. We know that the um, Internal loss is this internal opening. External loss is the external opening to the cervical canal. And for childbirth to take place, uh, known as parturition, it's not going to be, you know, efficient, effective to try to move the offspring through the cervical canal. So basically the cervical canal shrinks up and that's what's known as effacement. So um, let me show you some other pictures. So here, uh, they're looking at that thick uh, cervical canal. So effacement has not occurred. But you can see how the cervical canal start, the cervix starts to thin up. And so here they're saying that there's 50% effacement. And here they're saying 100% effacement. It just means basically that that cervical canal went away. Okay, so the cervix will thin, and that's what effacement is. Dilation is an actual opening, the cervical opening getting wider. And so just to skip to another picture, this picture just shows effacement. Uh, so you can see the cervix and then you can see as the cervix goes away and here they're not um, mixing effacement and dilation. So in other words, I can see that the cervical opening is still the same size even over here at 100% effaced. And so effacement is tracked <clears throat> using percentages. Now uh, the cervical um, opening getting bigger, that's what's known as dilation. And so in this picture, they're showing us both processes. So um, effacement and the normal opening um, of the uh, cervical canal. And of course, that opening is going to get bigger and bigger. It's going to go from, they say, like the Cheerio to the bagel type of size opening. And once the um, opening, the cervical opening is dilated 10 centimeters by definition, uh, dilation and the, the person is 100% effaced, once you reach those two landmarks, um, then officially dilation is uh, complete. So just to take a, a look, another look at some pictures, these are the diagrams from our book of dilation. So he, here you can see effacement is complete, right, because we don't see that uh, long narrow uh, cervix. <clears throat> and some dilation, early dilation, here we can see full dilation. So at 10 centimeters, 
the offspring's head should be able to um, pass out of the uterus. And so that brings us to the second stage of labor, which is expulsion, which would be from full dilation to delivery of the offspring. And during expulsion, uh, two things that will occur, engagement, you know, offspring's head enters into the pelvic girdle. I'll show you some pictures of that and crowning. Um, so to jump over to some pictures, engagement would be, as uh, we said, when the offspring's head enters into the uh, mother's pelvic girdle. So here we can see the offspring is not engaged. Okay, the offspring's head is just uh, starting to enter into um, the pelvic inlet uh, compared to here where the offspring's head is inside of the mother's pelvic girdle. That's what engagement is. And so engagement is assessed by where the offspring's head is compared to the mother's ischial spine. And I know we learned the ischial spine in AP1, so I thought you would be interested in that. So they compare ischial spine to offspring's um, head, and that would be at station zero. So as the uh, head starts to approach the ischial spines, they're at a negative station. And then as the offspring's head starts to uh, go further than the ischial spines, they're at a positive um, station. And so uh, offspring's head will enter into the vagina, and when the offspring's head starts to extend um, the vulva, so start to be exposed from um, the vaginal opening, uh, that's what's known as crowning. And so I'll show you a photograph of crowning. Okay, so here we can see the offspring's head is just starting to uh, distend from the vaginal opening. And here we can see delivery of the offspring's head. Uh, so this is a vertex presentation, which is a head first presentation. And there are many different types of vertex presentations. Uh, here we can see the, the face is facing the sacrum. And that is advantageous because of the um, flat nature of the sacrum that's easier on the offspring. And typically, whoever is attending the delivery is going to suction, you know, the respiratory uh, tract of the offspring right at this point to help the offspring um, start um, uh, breathing. So I have some historic uh, diagrams pulled up here for you. Uh, to show you breach presentations. So breach presentation would be anything other than head first. And so in this uh, picture, you can see this is the presentation, the vertex presentation that I was just, uh, we were just looking at. So head first, head uh, facing, posterior. So the offspring will rotate uh, during delivery. But uh, here's a breach presentation. And so you can see the buttocks first presentation. That would be a very common uh, breach presentation. Uh, or delivery of uh, a limb during the expulsion phase. That's when like the presenting portion of the offspring, uh, hopefully the, the head, would start to um, uh, extend from the vagina. So again, there's a limb first. And breech presentations uh, make delivery very um, much more risky. Here you can see umbilical cord issue with uh, breech presentation or with delivery of the body. The head is the biggest uh, part of the offspring that has to um, be delivered. And so there's the question mark of, you know, will there be problems with that compared to like the head first delivery where you can uh, know that the offspring will be delivered and you can also help the offspring with um, suction of the respiratory tract. So that's expulsion. Once the offspring is delivered, uh, the third stage of labor is delivery of the placenta. And because the placenta is not muscular, uh, the uterus will continue to contract. The placenta will automatically, you know, just um, separate from the uterine wall. And so what comes out is called afterbirth, which would be the placenta plus all the embryonic membranes. And so this is examined just as the offspring is examined after delivery to make sure everything is normal and uh, looks, looks like it doesn't need any more uh, intervention.
Um, so uh, to finish up, I, I moved mammary glands. So this is actually in um, my female reproductive PowerPoint, and it's um, in the uh, a female reproductive system portion of the book, but I just thought it made more sense to run through the structure of the breast here, and we'll look at the hormonal regulation of lactation. So to take a look at some um, pictures here, let's take a look at the structure of the breast. So the breast is made up of um, secretory um, compartments called lobes. And the lobe of a breast would be the part of the uh, breast that is being conveyed out through, this is what's called a lactiferous duct. Okay, so a lactiferous duct is going to convey the milk that's made out of, uh, made from one lobe of the breast. So see if this makes sense. So this is what we would call a lobe because all of that milk would exit through that lactiferous duct. There are probably going to be about like 12, 20, 24 lactiferous ducts, as you can see, that exit out of the nipple. Some lactiferous ducts exit out of the areola or the areola, however you want to pronounce that, which is the pigmented skin that surrounds the nipple. So some lactiferous ducts will exit there, but most are going to be concentrated within the nipple. And so the a lobe of the breast reminds me, if this makes any sense, this analogy of a bunch of grapes, where the lactiferous duct is the part conveying the milk out of the nipple, but just like a bunch of grapes, do you see how the um, stem is going to branch? Same thing. So in the breast, that lactiferous duct, it actually branches into, you know, different segments of the grapes would be like milk producing um, tissue. And so uh, just like in the lungs, what you have is you have a single layer of epithelial tissue that's producing a product and then that product leaves, it's an, uh, you know, it's an exocrine gland. So it's going to leave through a duct onto a surface. So all of these, um, these are called alveolar glands, uh, are producing the milk inside. And then that milk is, would uh, leave through the ducts uh, onto the uh, surface. So the lobe is made up of lobules. And the lobules are made up of these lactiferous glands that are actually producing the milk. So to go back over to the picture, you can see um, here's a lobe, here's a lobe, and you can see the ducts of those lobes merge together. There's a little dilated region right below the nipple. This is called the lactiferous sinus. And then the lactiferous sinus leads into the lactiferous duct. Uh, in between the alveolar glands that are producing the milk, are just connective tissue um, uh, ligaments. Okay, so these are called Cooper's ligaments, these ligaments that are in between, or also known as suspensory ligaments. So either way, suspensory ligaments or Cooper's ligaments are just ligaments that are anchoring uh, the lobes of the breast in place. And of course, um, this glandular tissue has been built up um, during gestation I remember the human placental lactogen helped to build up that glandular tissue and now at the end of um, gestation the hormone prolactin is going to be released and it's going to cause milk production. So I'm just going to jump to a different picture that has to do with lab, not uh, our class. But in lab I, you look at inactive mammary tissue, uh, inactive mammary gland and active and so here you can see all of the Cooper's ligaments or suspensory ligaments which is all this gray squiggly stuff this bright purple stuff, that's the glandular tissue. So in a non-lactating female, that tissue is very minimal. And we can even see adipose tissue over here compared to if you look at a lactating female, you can see the tissue is filled with this um, purple. This is the alveolar glands, right? All of those white little air pockets are where milk is being produced. And then this pink tissue that's kind of weaving in between, those are the suspensory ligaments that are anchoring the breast tissue in place. So uh, milk production and um, uh, nursing an infant, that, that, that's all hormonally uh, regulated. So here, this is just a very minimal outline of um, 
uh, the uh, anatomy that I showed you. And so for milk uh, production and milk ejection from the breast, like I said, there's, there's two mechanisms involved. So milk production has to do with this hormone prolactin compared to milk ejection from the breast. Milk ejection from the breast, uh, some people think that it's like the offspring that uh, can, you know, actually like uh, vacuum suck, you know, the milk right out of the breast. Actually, it's ejected from the breast due to this hormone oxytocin. And actually, that makes me think of another theory. Actually, with the head first vertex uh, presentation of birth uh, in more ancient times, uh, people thought that the infant would use their feet to actually eject themselves from the uterus. And of course, that's that's not the case either. So I gave you a picture and I thought, let's look through this picture and then we'll look through the notes. So in this picture, uh, they're going through one of the mechanisms and I added the other one on myself just so we could have both things in one place. I thought that would be easier. So number one, you can see the uh, initial stimulus is that the nursing infant uh, latches on to the mother. So there's mechanical stimulation of the nipple. That could also be a uh, breast pump. So it doesn't have to be the, um, you know, a nursing infant. But number two, pressure receptors, afferent impulses to the hypothalamus. So I'm going to just kind of skip over those and just say that is the stimulus on the mother's brain. So what's happening at the level of the mother's brain is, sorry about that, uh, oxytocin, uh, we talked about that, is going to um, be released. So the posterior pituitary is going to release oxytocin, but also uh, what is going to happen here is that it's going to cause the hypothalamus uh, to release another hormone called prolactin releasing hormone. And prolactin releasing hormone is going to trigger the anterior pituitary to secrete a hormone called prolactin which I'm abbreviating, abbreviating with the PRL. Okay, so that's the hormone prolactin. So once there's mechanical stimulation of the nipple, what's happening is the, that's going to cause the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin, and it's going to cause the anterior pituitary to release prolactin. What prolactin is going to do is it's going to circulate to the alveolar glands, and it's going to cause actual milk production. That's compared to oxytocin. What oxytocin is going to do is it's going to, uh, we know it's a smooth muscle contractant. That's going to cause a contraction of smooth muscle in the breast, and that's going to cause release of the milk, uh, something called the milk letdown reflex. And so oxytocin is going to eject the milk from the breast, and what prolactin is going to do is it's going to cause the milk to build back up. It's going to cause more milk production. So that as long as there's mechanical stimulation of the nipple, there will be milk production. Again, whether that's from the nursing uh, offspring or from um, a pump. Once this mechanical stimulation stops, then milk production will also start to stop. So to take a look at this in the notes, just so you can see how I wrote this. Um, with milk production, stimulus uh, would be stimulation of the nipple is going to cause the hormone prolactin to be re released from the anterior pituitary, and that's going to cause um, milk production. Okay, that's the effect of it. It's going to target the breast and cause milk production. Compared to oxytocin is, again, also being released due to stimulation from uh, mother's nipple, uh, but that hormone is coming from the posterior pituitary, it, and it causes... Uh, uh, milk um, ejection from the breast, the milk letdown reflex uh, by targeting smooth muscle. So initially when um, the offspring is born, there's not mature um, breast milk that's released. Uh, it's called colostrum that is released in the first two to three days. It has only about like one third of the fat that you'd find in normal milk. And it's also made at a much lesser quantity. But in um, a newborn, they're hydrated, they have a high fat content, and they don't have uh, the need for the quantity of milk that they're going to have as after the first few days. Uh, but this, the colostrum is much richer in um, protein, including antibodies. And because the um, newborn, a newborn human, their gut is so leaky compared to our mature gut, 
uh, newborns can actually absorb full proteins. We can't do that. We absorb, we break down the protein into amino acids and then we absorb the amino acids. But in um, a newborn, they can absorb uh, whole proteins and antibodies are proteins. And so this is a way prior to the person's immune system <clears throat> being um, formed, fully formed, uh, that the mother can provide uh, antibodies for um, the developing offspring. And so after the first few days, then uh, the mother will produce regular breast milk. And just in case you're interested, let me show you um, a database. So all I did is I typed into my um, browser LactMed, and you'll find this um, lactation um, and drugs database, which I thought might be helpful for some of you, being that you're going into um, healthcare. So this is a, a really interesting database where you can look up a substance and it will tell you how much of it, if any, uh, will be found in breast milk. And so that could be a resource for you for future um, patients. So um, that's it. We finished the reproductive system. We'll be back for more endocrine system next time. Thank you.